right, it's time to start. Girls and boys. Get your lunch finished. Now, some days there are good lectures. Some days there are bad lectures. Some days there's good material. Some days there's bad material. This is, in fact, the worst material we're ever going to talk about. Okay. So, what makes this material so bad? Is it because it says diffusivity? Equation? Is it because it says radial linear flow? Dylan, when you uh, go to sleep at night and dream about equations, you always start with this one? Is that because that's the way you were taught? Yeah? I dream about this one because the first time I saw it, I never thought I'd understand it. A distinguished colleague of mine says, and I quote, it is impossible for undergraduates to comprehend the meaning or the application of differential equations. How many of you agree with that? Oh, God. <laughs> Let me put it another way. I'm not staying here another year <laughs> to make sure some of you graduate. All right. So if we were to write out the diffusivity equation like Dilhan and I start our thought process with it, thought process with it, you'd become intimidated. But you have to remember it's just a differential equation like any other. You want to reduce it to the most compact form. Now, in an undergraduate class, we're going to do that for you. Mr. Harlan, what did I just say? <coughs> wah, 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 wah. Sorry? Is that what I said, Dilhan? Yeah. I said we would reduce it to the most compact form. Okay. Now tell me what I meant. <laughs> you know, on the uh, Discovery Channel, when you're not watching about how things get aug augmented, you're watching about the beginning of life. This is that beginning of life moment, Mr. Harlan. You got to master this, so you can't go any further. This is the amino acid for reservoir simulation. This is the starting point for everything we do. And the last couple of days, I've been doing a, another of my free consulting jobs for all you pagans who know that, you know, like uh, any good parent, I'll never charge my children. Although I am writing up a bill for this one because it's a doozy. And they have violated just about every assumption in the differential equation in their field practices, and they want the differential equation to save them. Is it going to save them, class? So who is or what is going to save them? No. Because I beat in them before they did this that they need to be taking more and better data. I'll never forget the email that they sent, which said, you know, we know you're right, but this well is already a good producer, and we don't feel like it justifies the expense. So let me get this straight. You know the right thing to do, but you're not going to do it. I'm trying to think, what is that called? Oh, yeah, that, you're a criminal, right? <laughs> am, I, am I right? Okay. So whenever we start talking about the differential equation that we're going to call the diffusivity equation, you're going to hear me talk about violating its assumptions. Okay? And everything we do in applications violates the assumptions in one form or another. Is the viscosity and compressibility of a liquid really constant? Yes, no, maybe, no, it's not, right? Is the viscosity and compressibility of a gas ever really constant? Yes, no, maybe, always no. 
So we can cheat and we can create something called a constant compressibility liquid and it follows certain assumptions. But if you start applying that solution or that set of assumptions to everything, something's going to break down. And in fact, that's what happened here. We can also reformulate the problem. You're going to hear me talk about pseudo pressure and maybe even a little bit about pseudo time. You're not going to have to worry about these, except on the exam, of course. But what you have to do is think about it as taking a chicken and turning it into a duck. Mr. Goins likes this, right? So if you make it, can a chicken fly? A little bit. Can it swim? No. <laughs> so, oh yeah? What if you put a life jacket on it? Yeah. Let's go out in the middle of Lake Somerville and throw some chickens in and see what happens. Yeah. When I was uh, a little bit younger than you, I was in Boy Scouts, which was a requirement in Louisiana as a survival skill. And we, we trapped an armadillo, which now you find out gives you leprosy, right? And it was a big one. We had it by its tail, and it was, you know, maybe two and a half feet long or something. It was a monster. And the scout leader looks at us and he says, you know, I always wondered if an armadillo could swim. I heard they just walked along the bottom. And he takes this armadillo <laughs> like the hammer throw in the Olympics, and he takes a couple of swings and pitches it out in the west fork of the Calcasieu, and we're all calculating one, two, three, skabloosh. <laughs> We never saw that on the <laughs> All right, so we're going to start by talking about labeling diffusivity equations. We have the Blackwell equation. Ah, oh, man, this doesn't like me over here. We have the solution gas drive equation. And we have the dry gas equation. And then we have the multiphase equation. The multiphase diffusivity equation is going to look like a trip that you might take on black tar heroin, okay? <laughs> but trust me, it is the most fundamental starting point for reservoir simulation. So next year, when some of you are taking Dr. McVeigh's simulation class for the first or second or third time, whichever it may be, you can impress him by saying, oh, those are the fundamental equations of flow. And you know, there's a time-dependent component, and we all know that the compressibility term isn't constant, or the free gas term isn't, you know, whatever it is, and, and so forth, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, he'll go like this, and that'll be an interesting moment for me, because I'll be gone. But that's, I'm hopefully not forgotten. Now, the diffusivity equation for a black oil actually looks like this. And this is a so-called nonlinear term. Why is it nonlinear? Okay, that's correct. It's nonlinear because a derivative is raised to a power other than one. There's another reason it's nonlinear. Anybody want to take a shot? Because of the C del P squared term. Oops, I wrote it wrong. My mistake. There's a special nomenclature here. Dohan minus how much? Nothing. Good. Good answer. C is a function of pressure. And, of course, the gradient is a function of pressure. And I guess we should say it differently, sorry. Now I'll check, where's your girlfriend? Has she left yet? Okay. You just let her up there without any escort, huh? That's love, man. All right. If you have an F of P times a G of P, that's a nonlinearity. Where's Loco today? Ah, 
You're sitting in your now favorite spot, I see. So back whenever I was in my first semester of graduate school, Dr. Lee said to the class, he said, what is a nonlinear partial differential equation? Sorry? Yes, I know. But if you'll notice, he doesn't move a lot. It's kind of robotic, you know. Actually, he's always been like that, but that's a story for another time. So he asked the class to describe why, uh, uh, you know, what uh, makes something nonlinear, or what is the result of a nonlinear or a linear differential equation. And Dohan, what was the student's response? It was, a linear equation is one that makes a straight line on a graph. And I'll never forget Dr. Lee's absolutely deadpan answer. No, that's not quite right, because that has nothing to do with linearity. These are the rules of linearity in mathematics. You cannot have a derivative raised to a power greater than one. You cannot have a function of the y variable, the dependent variable, multiplied by itself or by another term, so you can't have a square or anything like that. And that's the definition of nonlinearity. Okay, so you really don't care about all that. Let's make this go away. How do we make this equal to zero? Somebody tell me. Sorry? Uh, then it would have no energy. It is slightly compressible. So you're saying that the compressibility is so small that its multiplication times the gradient doesn't matter. That's actually true. Chalk one up for Mr. Cock. So the slightly compressible. What else? Mm, no, that's not quite right. <laughs> Sorry? Delta P, the gradient, is very small. Okay? So the combination of these two things, if compressibility is very small and delta P is very small, small times small is what? At really small, thank you. Okay, so this is our definition of the slightly compressible equation. Marmina, you were so full of energy last week. This is an operator, kind of like you're an operator. Do you know what the expansion of this looks like for the radial flow geometry? <laughs> You want to give me a hint? <laughs> it's 1 over R. <laughs> D by DR. R. DP. DR. Johan, that's correct, right? And if you were to ask me what these backward sixes are, I'd say that you probably belong in another discipline. Go ahead. What's a backward six? Sorry? Differential. What kind of differential? Partial. Partial differential, okay? So the whole equation looks like this. 1 over r, d by dr, r, dp dr, of course this is horizontal radial flow, is equal to phi mu ct over k, D, P, D, T. There's your second order partial differential equation. What are the variables, class? R and T, right? Those are your variables. What's your, those are your independent variables. What, what is your dependent variable? P. Okay. Dohan, any comments on your part? I think we've blown their brain clean out of their skulls, correct? Okay. This Leela, on Monday, we're going to take a solution to this differential equation, and we're going to substitute it into it. To do what? This is an undergraduate class, and so we're not going to solve the differential equation. We're going to go backwards, and we're going to take the solution and put it into the differential equation. Okay? Do you believe everything you're told? 
pretty much. So if we take the well-known solution and we stick it in this differential equation, what should happen? We should end up with 1 equals 1. The left-hand side and the right-hand side should be equal, right? If they're not equal, then what? No. Good answer, though, Mr. Beard. I like your train of thought. You know, he says you screwed up. What if you get the right answer, but still you don't get 1 equals 1? What? English this time. You know you're going to swallow that thing and it's going to come out real hard. <laughs> Try again. I'm sorry? No, no, we take what is, we take the Marmina equation, which is supposedly brought down from the times of the pharaohs. <laughs> you know? And we take that equation and we put it into the diffusivity equation and out pops not exactly 1 equals 1. Yes? Yes, we are going to give you a particular solution that we are going to state is a solution to this differential equation, and you're going to substitute it in, go through all this old calculus stuff, right? I know you took it three times. I looked at your thing, so you're okay. You, you know how to do this. I mean, how you could even teach the class. Sorry? I had to take calculus one, two, and three. Yeah, three times, so that's nine, okay? <laughs> now, if we substitute that solution in, and what's, what we're saying is we're going to give you some P of RT is equal to some, you know, junk in terms of R and T, okay? You're going to substitute it into the differential equation, and it's supposed to equal 1 on each side. Everything cancels, right? What happens if everything doesn't cancel? Sorry? Uh, louder? What if, how can we explain this another way, Dohan? There is going to be a case that's an exact solution. And then there's going to be a time where we approximate the exact solution. And nobody ever thinks to go back and stick the approximation in to the differential equation and see if it actually works. This, act, this happens a lot. So as an undergraduate problem, I can guarantee you that we're going to give you some equation and tell you to stick it in here and tell us whether or not it's an exact solution. Now, if it does not come out to 1 equal 1, Marmina, does that mean it's not a solution? No, it means it's not an exact solution. That is not a test for necessarily being a solution. It is a test for whether or not it could be an approximation. You could come up with an infinite number of things that you could substitute in there that might all cancel, but have nothing to do with this problem. You could make up something that worked, but had nothing to do with this problem. Like you said, you didn't use the boundary conditions, or you didn't use the correct initial condition. You just picked something out of the air that worked like rate, uh, sorry, uh, time divided by r squared might work here. I don't know. I haven't thought it through. But, you know, that, that is not a solution of this equation with the boundary conditions we specified. Okay? So get familiar with the liquid equation. All right. And I think I'll skip that. I'll skip that. Now let's talk about the pseudo-pressure form. And the oil pseudo pressure, we're not going to give you this on the test, or maybe we will, huh? We haven't done that in a while. We should give oil pseudo pressure. Now nah, let's give gas. Gas is fun. Oil's kind of stupid. Why is oil stupid, class? Easy. Thank you. Good answer. Anybody else? So we're going to normalize the integrand, which all this, of course, is in the denominator, by this term out here, mu o, b o 
at some pn. And then we're going to multiply through, and the units here are going to be pressure. So this looks, smells, and tastes like pressure, but it's not pressure. It's pseudo pressure. And how does pseudo pressure help us? How can we not be required to use pseudo pressure? Somebody enlighten me. Mr. Arthur, if we assume that mu rho vo is constant, correct? Then it's constant here, and it's constant there, and everything's gone. So for the case where mu rho vo is constant, we don't need pseudo pressure, right? So let's use a reverse proof of that and go forward and look at these graphics. So this is 1 over mu rho vo. Is that relatively constant, class? Well, it's not bad, actually. In the whole scheme of things, you probably don't need to use pseudo pressure. Dohan, do you agree? For the oil case. Unless it's really spongy. And spongy means that it has some character to it. Okay. Marmina, you like this? You ready for the next? Now, what about our compressibility friend? This is mu rho co. Look at this. Mr. Arthur, could it be constant here? Yeah. But then when we take the logarithm of this and plot it versus the logarithm of pressure, here's a slope of 1, here's a slope of 2, right? So now we have a line, basically, that looks like that, a straight line. That's going to be mu rho co is approximately equal to some alpha p to the minus beta, right? Is that constant, class? No. This is kind of where we have to close our eyes and say, OK, we're going to violate a very serious assumption. This is clearly not constant. But we're going to assume it's constant. Is that OK? Everybody's like, is this on the test? Yeah. OK. Do you have anything you can think of that we might enlighten them with this? How many of you are going to lay awake at night and worry about assuming something's constant and it actually changes a lot? Like your bank account. Just so seeing if anybody's awake. All right. You know, at University of Texas, apparently Dr. Pope and Dr. Lake remind their classes that the smartest person in their department is each other. I mean, not each other, but themselves. But I think the smartest living reservoir engineer is this guy, Camacho, and maybe his advisor, Raghavan. They did a whole bunch of work in the late 1990s on the uh, mobility, compressibility, and other functions in solution gas drive systems. For ease of note, this is early, and this is late. Okay? This is compressibility divided by mobility. So think about it as compressibility divided by uh, porosity divided by viscosity. So there it's constant, and there it's constant. There it's constant, and there it's constant. What's going on here? Okay, this is where we went through the bubble point, that's correct. So what happens is initially when you're at or near or above the bubble point, this function, this average compressibility divided by average mobility is basically constant, which is good. That makes sense. It's a liquid. And then later on, dot, 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 it becomes constant again. Dot, 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 for both cases. He's using constant pressure cases here, which is pretty severe. 
So what this tells you is that as long as we're in transient flow, we're probably okay. The transition is what's going to be a problem. This is kind of a beyond the scope of the course. But what it's telling us is fundamentally we can use the liquid condition without any problems. That's what it's telling us. Okay. Now, the discoverer of pseudo pressure was whom? There was a big fight back in the 60s, and there was a guy here named Ramey. He had gone to Stanford later, and then there was a fellow at, at uh, Shell named Russell, and another guy named Pratt's, and some other people. And they were all fighting over who invented pseudo pressure. It was a fight over nothing. Because our good friend, Mr. Muscat, if he had had a computer, this is February 1942, he showed the pseudo pressure formulation for the first time. And he basically said, ah, who cares? I can't calculate it anyway because I don't have a computer. So the point was that he recognized that sooner or later we were going to have to deal with this. And this is the basis of Muscat's premise is that probably for most problems it doesn't matter. And you can see this, however, it will be for sufficient for the calculation of productivity factor. Consider only a limiting form, which means a liquid case. My Russian friend, you ready? Who invented the telephone? Not Zambrovsky. <laughs> Yeah. I thought when you were a little girl in Russia, they taught you that, that the imperialist uh, Bell stole the design and claimed it as his own. No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which may be true. Who knows? There was a paper by Warren and Root, and they stole the results of Baron Blatt and Zeltov, and they did add one very important part. They added a connecting condition. Uh, but it's interesting how the Russians all did it first. But I mean, it's cold. You don't have a lot to do, you know, so you can, you, you derive or drink or whatever. And they, uh, well, I'm, I'm complimenting them, right? I mean, they, huh? You don't think it's, you don't think it's complimentary to say they were good mathematicians? Yeah, yeah. And good drinkers. So you don't believe that the post-communist depression caused alcoholism to go up 300%? Yeah? yeah? It was some other factor. It was that it was better economic times so you could drink more? Yeah, okay, I don't know. I don't know how I got off on that. So this guy Muscat supposedly invented pseudopressure, right? But who really invented integral transforms for properties that are a function of the dependent variable. In this case, it's pressure. Do you know? Our good friend Kirchhoff. And he did it about 80 years earlier. And probably before that, it was Marmina's family. Back in... Okay. Am I right? Oh, no. You guys never got past that knotted rope thing. I'm really amazed that the Egyptians invented trigonometry with a rope with 12 knots. How'd you do that? <laughs> Is it time for the quiz? Uh, we'll give them a minute. Yeah, we should. You want to stop now? Or? Gas is pretty tough compared to liquid. Let's stop now and we'll... Is that okay? You guys want to stop now or you want to keep going? Yeah.